I'm also a professor at the USC University. Yes. And uh, well, he's been pioneering workloads uh, for many years now. And so we had a very good uh, relationship along the years. So uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, her here yeah. to present. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, no, you, you need to do it. So it's a pleasure to have her here. Take your time because uh, we are a bit delayed. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosa. And it's a, a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about uh, scientific workflows and the work that we've been uh, doing over the years. Um, so, uh, as we all know, we live in a very heterogeneous world with various displays that don't work all the time and uh, various other features, but uh, we have very heterogeneous applications, we have different resources that are available to the users, and you, the users themselves are very heterogeneous. So I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. So if we look at the users, you know, sometimes they come from these large scale collaborations. So you can think of high energy physics, for example, uh, where you have a lot of people working together. They have embedded teams of uh, specialists that, that are familiar with computer science and IT in general. Then you have medium sized teams that so could be a few PIs working together on a particular project. So kind of medium size, um, maybe you can think of um, uh, labs doing MRI or other types of uh, science, and they also have some dedicated people that work with them that, that understand the technologies to help them manage um, the data. And then you have individual PI, so you have somebody, a, a, a principal investigator that works, uh, he has a small team, or she have a, has a small team uh, of students, and the, they might not have as much knowledge about computer science or technologies altogether. And then you have the educators in the public that also want to participate in the process and learn about science and, and uh, technology. However, they don't have the knowledge that, that um, you know, to, about the technologies that they need to use to do science. So they really would like to have interfaces such as that iPad to, to really learn about uh, uh, what's out there. And then obviously you have the public as well. Uh, the applications uh, themselves are very heterogeneous, so they're most likely to be uh, not monolithic. Um, they have a mixture of single core or parallel computing uh, uh, jobs in them. They can be written in a variety of languages. Um, they have dependencies, data dependencies, control dependencies. Um, they uh, increasingly access data coming from instruments. So on the right, you have an example of an instrumented uh, water stream. Uh, that comes from the uh, NEON project uh, in the US, where they have sensors around the, the stream. They also have weather stations and others that collect data and you want to analyze it uh, close to real time. And obviously you still have the uh, large scale simulations and uh, processing of large amounts of data uh, coming from them. Uh, the resources themselves are very heterogeneous. So you can think of the sensors that you have uh, deployed in the water, your phone, tablets, um, various instruments, so it could be MRI machines that you're collecting data or large-scale telescopes. You have edge devices uh, all the way up to the HPC resources. And the work that you need to do or the computations need, that you need to do span all these uh, types of systems. <clears throat> so uh, we started looking at how to support uh, scientific users back in, in 2001. Uh, this is a, a picture of Virgo at that time. You can see how old the, the the cars look like. And so Virgo is one of these gravitational wave uh, observatories that collects data. It's a new Pisa in Italy. It collects data uh, that uh, basically hoping to, and they did detect gravitational waves. So the idea is the, if the wave comes through this instrument we see in the middle, it's a, if they have two kilometer arms uh, with masses suspended in the arms. If the wave passes through them, you see small changes in, in the shape of, of these uh, suspended masses. So then you can you do a lot of data analysis to try to figure out if it's a real uh, signal that you see coming from a gravitational wave, or maybe some uh, other types of phenomena could be a seismic wave or others. So um, in 2001, uh, we worked with LIGO to develop uh, a prototype where it would take the data coming of the instruments 
uh, and uh, then process it. So first of all, we needed to understand how the environment looked like. So they had data collected in the instruments, but were then uh, replicated in the environment. So here they were storing data uh, in Milwaukee and also at Caltech in California. Uh, they also had computing that was distributed in the, air, in, in the environment. So basically what you had to deal with is this notion of the data sets being distributed and the computing being distributed as well. Um, so uh, in 2001, uh, we, um, we developed a model which we call the virtual data grid, which allowed scientists to come into the system and ask for a data product. Um, either it was just do a high level type of requesting. I want data that comes, uh, gravitational wave results that come from a particular uh, time period. And the user would not have to know about whether the, where the data is located, whether it's already been computed or it's stored somewhere. Um, so the system would go out to try to figure out um, what the user wanted, then to look in this environment, whether the data was already accessible or whether it needed to be computed on demand and then uh, give it to the user. So uh, in the uh, case of LIGO, um, basically it was the user would make a request for data for do a false search of a particular time period. And then the system would uh, try to understand the, the request. It will uh, look at the uh, replica catalogs that had the information about the data. And then if it uh, uh, either delivered the data or designed the plan of how to get it. Um, so in, uh, uh, during that time period, we developed this uh, web interface for the user where the user could put in all that information. And in the back end, uh, at that time, we also used the uh, AI planning technologies, which are very, uh, uh, very rudimentary to basically, based on this request, uh, develop the, the scenario on the right where the data, raw data was taken from the, uh, from the archive. It was cleaned, it was transposed into these longer time periods. And then um, there was a time frequency image that was constructed out of that. And if it looked good, it was a candidate wave, it would put it in an event database. So we showed this um, the system to, uh, we had a demo at uh, supercomputing in 2002. Um, in this system, um, we used, we had like a request manager, we, had, we used um, Condor Dagman and Condor uh, underneath to execute the workflow and to um, to manage the jobs. The jobs were distributed across the various resources and the data was pulled also uh, at that time during uh, so the old Globus Technologies grid FTP and GRAM to, to do the interfaces. Uh, we then showed this um, uh, after SC, we showed this uh, to our colleagues at LIGO and um, they didn't particularly like it. And the reason is that they didn't want to think of this web interface. What they really liked is to look at this uh, image that you see on the right, where you see the expansion of a request. So you see the entire workflow, all the steps that are involved uh, to get down to the science. So we forgot about the AI planning. Uh, we started looking directly at enabling users to compose these workflows um, the way they wanted uh, them to look like. Um, so the lessons learned from, from that time period uh, were that, you know, it was rewarding to, to work with uh, real world problems. Uh, however, you had to listen to the scientists because they have definite ideas of what they want to do. And it's not always aligned with what you want to do in computer science. So this concept of virtual data were very interesting to them, but they're too, um, too abstract. Uh, however, some things remain. So um, the notion of needing to deal with distributed resources remains. So that's something that uh, is carried uh, through our work uh, to today and things are getting even more distributed and heterogeneous. And we also developed this notion of separation between the abstract work for the abstract description and what is actually executed in the environment. And so uh, for us, the focus instead of the interfaces and the, the planning became really the uh, looking at the workflow and then planning it onto to the resources and scheduling them in a way that's performant um, and also uh, that has fault tolerance. Uh, so out of it came out the Pegasus workflow management system and we divided the challenges that we saw across uh, different applications. So we also started working with earthquake scientists and uh, astronomers. And so they had um, similar challenges. So they wanted to describe the complex workflows in an easy way. 
Um, they wanted to have this access to distribute resources, both data and compute. Um, they also had to deal with resources that change over time. So you get software upgrades or maybe a different resource comes online. So you need to be able to deal with that. And um, they wanted ease of use. So you, on both on the workflow submission, but also on, on the workflow monitoring debugging side. So in our work, we focus on the separation between the workflow description and the workflow execution, which allows us to port the workflow across um, different uh, systems. Uh, we focused on the planning and scheduling, as I mentioned earlier, um, on the task execution. So that's done in a thought torrent way and, and uh, with monitoring tools that can see what's going on. And we also uh, focus on various workflow optimization. So we restructure the workflow for uh, performance and thought torrents. Uh, so at the end, we got uh, the Pegasus Worker Management System that automates these uh, complex workflows. Uh, it en enables both distributed and parallel computations. Um, it infers the data transfer. So when the user just needs to specify what computations they want to do, if the computations land on different resources, Pegasus can transfer the data automatically. Uh, this supports uh, reusability and reuse, so you can share the same workflow with your colleagues and they can execute them uh, on a different resource, uh, on their own resources. Uh, we record provenance information, uh, we handle uh, a number of types of failures and we keep track of what's going on with the system. So just looking back over the years, so this is uh, in 2006, uh, LIGO was running, the chart shows weeks over time, and the CPU hours consumed. So LIGO was running um, on the open science grid, which is a distributed infrastructure in the US. And um, in 2016, uh, they had the first detection uh, of uh, two black holes colliding, uh, and they used Pegasus to, to do the computations for that discovery. In 2017, uh, the uh, LIGO scientists, three of the LIGO scientists won the Nobel Prize, in 2017, there was uh, another discovery of a multi-messenger, what they call messenger, multi-messenger discovery because the collision of uh, two neutral stars and merger was seen by not only LIGO, but also um, other telescopes in different types of spectra. So this is slide is to, to show you really that, you know, we started working with, with them in 2000, uh, in 2000. However, the first discoveries were, that were of significance were in 2016 and 17. So it really takes a very long time sometimes to work with somebody to, to get results that are meaningful to, to both sides. So patience in this business is key. Uh, in 2006, kind of looking back, you know, the, the most powerful machine um, uh, was, uh, we're talking uh, about uh, teragrids or task scale machines. Uh, in, uh, in that year, the um, DOE's uh, Lawrence Livermore machine at IBM BlueJean uh, was the top one on uh, the top 500 with uh, 280 teraflops. And now, obviously, we have exascale systems uh, in the US and China uh, that, you know, so it, over these, um, two, well, almost 20 years, uh, a lot of uh, has changed in computing as well. So, but the applications uh, need to migrate across these various systems over time because they're out there and they need they need uh, you know different types of resources. So um, during the development of Pegasus, we uh, finalized on five different types of principles that worked for us to move across these various systems as the systems changed and as the application changed. So one is this uh, uh, resource independent specification, where basically I mentioned it already, that you have the workflows in an abstract form when the scientists design it. So they talk about logical file names, uh, logical uh, transformations. So this is basically saying, I want to do uh, an FFT on file A, but you don't say which resources to use or where that FFT is located or where that file is located. So we use uh, catalogs to figure out where that is. And sometimes a user uh, or community provided. So LIGO has data, repli uh, depri data replica catalogs where they have information where the data resides. Uh, oftentimes computing sites also uh, um, uh, advertise the resources and you can discover where the um, uh, transformations are located. And then Pegasus takes that and generates the graph on the right which adds now jobs to move the data. So it stages data into the computations. 
if it was uh, uh, the execution was on two different resources, it would add additional nodes, data transfer nodes to this uh, to this graph as well. It uh, stages the data out to where the user wanted to, it to go. And then it also registers the data so you can find it again. And it does some data cleanup, which I'll mention uh, in a little while. Uh, so another application that we've been working with um, over the years is CyberShake. Uh, so they generate seismic hazard maps of uh, California. This is an execution back in, in 2006 um, on, um, I forget which machine, it was the machines, um, I think, uh, at the time, sorry, I forgot which ones. But uh, the, the interesting part of this was that um, CyberShake has a mix of MPI and high throughput computing jobs. So they do large scale simulations and then they follow by uh, followed by um, MPI codes. Um, uh, you know, 14 years later, they're, they're still executing these um, on the mix of high, uh, high performance computing and also uh, high throughput uh, computing resources. And um, they generate um, large amounts of data uh, and um, compute. And basically, again, that shows you that you need to be able to move these applications over time and help them uh, use the same workforce of so a structure of a workflow is basically the same. They did some optimizations. However, you can you could have run basically the workflow that was designed in 2006 on today's systems. Uh, so the other um, uh, principle that we have is this notion of uh, submit locally and uh, run globally. So we have a submit host where the uh, workflow management system lives. And from there, you submit jobs to your compute resources, uh, one or, or, or more. And we also have a notion that you can have a data uh, staging sites that, that can be separate uh, from the overall infrastructure. And so this allows us to model not only high performance computing systems where you have a, the storage co-located with a compute site, but also cloud resources and edge resources and so forth we have a notion of separation of storage uh, and, and compute. And then the job of Pegasus is to map the workflows onto these different types of um, uh, setups. So either high performance computing machines or, or others, and then use Dagman and Ishikondo for um, workflow execution and task execution. Uh, so this type of flexibility is used, for example, in the, um, uh, by scientists in Vermont. To, um, to model how the different policies in the environment would, um, that you apply in an environment would affect a particular lake in the US. And so they use not only their local resources, they also use um, uh, high performance computing systems uh, at UCAR and all within the same workflow. So for them, you know, basically they, they worry about the, um, the logic of the computations rather than where the computations are gonna take place. Um, so another thing that, uh, you know, there's different types of uh, separation of uh, data and compute uh, allow us to do is uh, in 2008, uh, we're able to start looking at cloud for um, uh, as a uh, execution platform for our workflows. And that was done pretty seamlessly because of that separation uh, of the workflow and the um, execution environment. And then this uh, submit locally. So you submit it from your own system um, to, to the cloud resources to do the computation. And in this case, we, we explored that, you know, the performance using different types of um, virtual infrastructures uh, for the montage workflow, which is an astronomy uh, workflow. Another thing that goes with that, and that's our third principle, is the flexible data staging configuration. So you need to be able, now that you have the separation um, of the data and compute, you need to be able to use um, different types. You need to um, have different ways of accessing the data. So we can, um, if we're running on a HD condo pool, we use HD condo IO. If we're running, you know, we can also have um, a shared file system where we imagine the, um, the storage being co-located with a compute resource. So you just do the direct IO uh, against the uh, shared file system. And also uh, with the separation, you can do um, basically pools of, uh, of data. Uh, once you land on a resource, the data can be pulled um, from, from these uh, staging sites and pushed to the staging sites for, for execution. 
And then finally, um, the other, uh, the fourth thing that you need to do, so now you have different ways of configuring the storage. You also need to be able to, to move the data. So we support a number of different protocols to do so. So you see it, the, the different protocols that we've been putting into Pegasus over the years um, based on different infrastructures that we run on. And um, we also developed a Pegasus transfer tool that allows us to use these protocols, but also adds additional um, types of functionality. So it can create uh, directories on the remote side, uh, remove uh, the files from there. Um, it can do two-stage data tra transfers if the protocols are not compatible between two storage systems. It does power transfers and also automatic retries, and it can either retry the same data from the same storage system, or it can look at if the data is also located maybe at a different storage site, it can uh, go to that site to do the, the data transfer. Uh, so this has been very helpful in applications uh, that are running at the edge. So we started looking at how we can uh, support um, these type of applications where you have some computing is done uh, close to where the data is being <clears throat> uh, collected, and then some of the computing is done uh, on the cloud. Uh, two of the applications that we've been working with is CASA, so <clears throat> it stands for Collaborative uh, and Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere. In this application, you have uh, radars that are deployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. This is a, an area that's very highly populated in the U.S., and it also is prone to severe weather. So when uh, weather uh, passes through, the computing that's available close to the radars uh, does some computations, but it needs additional resources to project the different wind velocities that are expected or to project how much rain you're gonna get in particular areas. And this is important for uh, the critical infrastructure hospitals and others to be able to figure out whether in the path of a hurricane or something else. Uh, so to do that additional computation, they move these computations uh, automatically with Pegasus uh, to the cloud. Um, another application, which is maybe a more traditional um, uh, edge application, we have um, an Ocean Observatory Initiative, which is a large uh, project in the US that has uh, deployments in the North, uh, North Atlantic, I think, uh, in the uh, North Pacific. And they have cable arrays and different buoys that hold uh, hydrophones and they can listen to uh, orca whale sound using um, this, these type of capabilities. So you can try to figure out uh, the number of orcas or other types of animals you have in a particular area. <laughs> uh, so our fifth principle um, is uh, the, what we call the up and down integration with diverse cyber infrastructure. So we recognize that users have different capabilities and different knowledge in terms of uh, languages that they use. So we started um, back in 2000, we started with Java, um, Python and, and R were not really around. So we started uh, providing interfaces and APIs in Java for people to construct their workflows. Um, then bioinformatic folks started using R uh, for, work for, for, for the work. So we added uh, R APIs. And then nowadays, most people are using uh, Python and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we also integrated with portals um, such as Hub Zero, Cybers, and On Demand, so the, the infrastructures in the US. And um, they allow basically scientists to use the capabilities without even knowing that there is a, a workflow underneath. And then um, below that, uh, we integrate with a number of different systems for job submission and for um, uh, data movement. So um, sometimes the different types of applications have their own systems that we need to integrate with. So this is an example from the Event Horizon Telescope. They use Pegasus to run the simulations that you see um, in this uh, picture uh, in the middle. So they run these simulations and then compare it to the observed images to try to figure out whatever characteristics of a, of a, a phenomena that, that they see with a telescope. Uh, in that case, they are integrated with uh, Cybers, which is a, a portal environment, which also has a lot of data management. So in this case, we provide capabilities to integrate with that. <clears throat> um, also, Xenon and T, which is a high energy physics experiment, uh, has their own data management, Rusio, and they use MongoDB for uh, tracking um, the runs. 
uh, of a workflow. So again, uh, we interface with these capabilities um, and they run on the European uh, grid infrastructure. So we interface with, with some of the features there. Um, another thing that we've been doing recently, uh, people are talking uh, quite a bit about this in the US in terms of um, integration of instruments into the workflow. So automatic um, uh, data analysis or at least partial data analysis when the data is coming off the instrument. This is a cryo EM facility at USC where scientists conduct their ex experiments. Data is pushed to the HPC system uh, on campus. From there, it's being picked up automatically by Pegasus, which does uh, a number of um, quick um, analysis on the data, trying to, uh, to generate images of what is happening on the um, microscope. And then it sends it uh, via Slack notifications to the users while they're running the experiment. So if the user needs to uh, change anything uh, during that experiment, uh, they can quickly do so um, and make the experimentation much more efficient. Uh, traditionally, basically, you took the data and then you went home and, and you analyzed it. Um, uh, so um, oftentimes we deal with uh, large scale applications. So this is an example uh, of montage, the astronomy ap uh, application. The scientists wanted to generate, it, generate the um, atlas of the uh, galactic plane in different types of spectrum. So they wanted, uh, they have data from 17 different spectra and to generate one of these images um, in one spectrum, it takes 18 million input uh, images and it generates uh, 900 output images to, to generate uh, the overall image. So basically this is to show that we're dealing with um, uh, large scale workflows uh, that can be quite complex. So we developed various optimization techniques to, uh, to help with that. Uh, one of them is uh, if we see that some of the data was already computed, so for example, maybe the calibrations have already been done, then we can reduce the workflow to only the parts that need to be done. And that's done still at the abstract level. So we, we reduce the workflow, and then once it's reduced, we map it onto the resources. So that helps with efficiency, but also it helps with fault recovery. So if you imagine the work on the left is being executed and some jobs fail, the user can give the system the abstract workflow again, and the system will figure out which parts of a workflow were already executed and just do what was left. So basically it provides you both optimization and um, checkpointing and recovery. So it work for such as montage also, uh, and uh, SCAC as well require additional uh, functionalities. So this is the Southern California Earthquake Center um, application I mentioned uh, earlier. Each of these dots on the map, I'm not sure you can, can see it uh, very clearly, but it's an individual workflow. So you don't want scientists to manage hundreds of these things by hand. So we developed an ensemble manager where you can submit the, the workflows that you want to do. And then Pegasus is run on each of these workflows to, to enable execution. And obviously we have various things. You can trigger this execution based on cron or file patterns. Um, so for example, if the data is coming off a microscope, that would be uh, a file pattern type of trigger. You can set properties uh, on the workflows themselves so you can have different priorities. So you can decide that uh, areas where the workflows are running um, that deal with high population areas are probably the most important ones. If you're running calculations about something in the desert, um, that maybe is not so important, so you can prioritize that. Or if you're uh, simulating a hurricane, for example, you also have paths that are more likely than others. And uh, we also have additional actions that you can pause and resume and so forth. <clears throat> um, so I, I mentioned um, SCEC a number of times. I think what, what's uh, interesting uh, about uh, this application is that it has this um, uh, MPI parts that do the large scale simulation. And then you have lots of jobs that are high throughput uh, that can be executed on uh, high throughput computing systems. And so when we uh, manage these applications, we have this consideration of different types of uh, systems that um, we need to execute on. And sometimes because we, we have these large numbers of, number of amounts of data that flow through the workflow. So um, for example, in, um, in this case, we had 1.2 petabytes of data 
It was managed by Pegasus, a data that was generated by the simulation and, and the post-processing. Uh, the, the transfers of the data was around 157 terabytes. Uh, if you transferred it between the simulation and the post-processing, so sometimes you want to run these workflows, uh, even though the, the post-processing is really a high throughput type of computation, single core, you want to run them on high performance computing resources so that you don't move the data uh, through the wide area. However, you cannot submit these uh, high throughput computing jobs directly to an HPC system because um, you have two hundred thousands of them, for example, then um, it, it will take forever. And also the uh, queuing systems don't allow you to submit that. Uh, that number, obviously. So um, we develop various techniques to deal with that. One is uh, task clustering, so you can cluster the task within the workflow, um, either by level or maybe by label in some different ways. Um, and then you basically increase the granularity of the computations and, okay, there are still single core tasks, but they're bigger. Um, you can also partition the workflow and sub -work into sub-workflows, and then you can submit one job to kind of follow that workflow for execution. Um, again, it's a single core, but um, you have increased granularity. The other thing is you can uh, put pilot jobs uh, through the scheduling system on an HPC machine, and then you can directly schedule tasks onto that pilot job without going through the scheduler. So that's another way of uh, improving performance and uh, providing scalability. However, you're still executing single core jobs uh, and pushing them through the system. So one thing we, we've developed um, is a specialized uh, NPI-based execution engine, uh, which basically we carve out a piece of a workflow, we attach an engine to it and ship it all um, from Pegasus, from the submin host of a, a computational system. On that side, it basically the NPI jobs, uh, the, uh, the workflow execution engine starts up as an NPI job and it executes the workflow as a master worker uh, paradigm, basically uh, giving out tasks to the workers um, to execute the computations. This can also be used in conjunction with a task clustering. But as a result, what the HPC system sees is basically a large NPI computation. Uh, and you're running uh, the, the post-processing, the single core jobs uh, on, on that resource. So um, we, we spend a lot of time dealing with uh, large-scale workflows. Some other things that we've developed are the notion of a workflow within the workflow. So you can put, uh, you know, basically hierarchies within a workflow. So Pegasus comes to that uh, job in green. It actually it expands into a sub workflow, which Pegasus again manages. So you, you call Pegasus within Pegasus to manage these sub workflows. And it gives you basically um, scalability. So you have Pegasus that each Pegasus deals with a smaller uh, chunk of work. And uh, it also um, provides you just in time planning. So if resources are changing a lot, you can plan portions of a workflow at a time. And then uh, finally, uh, in terms of scalability, other issues that we're dealing with are the management of data. So some workflows are quite large and uh, the data does not necessarily fit onto the execution site. So we've developed um, the data cleanup algorithms would basically look at the structure of a workflow and have a data flows for it and then add nodes to the workflow to remove the data. So that minimizes the data footprint. Uh, on the graph on the right, you see uh, Pegasus, um, the green line shows you the execution of a workflow uh, over time and how much data it, it, footprint is taking up. Um, and it's obviously monotonically increasing as you're not doing any cleanup. And then um, uh, with cleanup, which you see the red dots uh, below, you can basically reduce the data footprint. Uh, this was shown just for a small example, but we also ran it uh, on uh, bigger examples um, and we applied it to LIGO, which uh, first came to us uh, with this problem. Uh, and the issue with LIGO is that if you look at the top left graph, it basically brings in all the data first and then does the processing. So already they, they hit the max uh, at the top. So what we did is we developed uh, restructuring that uh, you see uh, uh, in the middle, that restructures the, no, the, the jobs into different structures, which basically gives you, um, and then can use cleanup, it gives you 36% improvement. 
And then we restructured it some more and we got a 56% improvement in, in the data footprint. So again, uh, we're very happy we showed it to LIGO uh, and uh, you know, we, we have this graph, we, we moved it into something like this. And so the question is, is it a good thing? It turns out it's not a good thing because LIGO scientists can understand this and it cannot understand this on the right. So you know, again, and that was many years after our first episode with LIGO. Um, as I have to say, they, they taught us many lessons over the years. So we, we cannot forget about the users. So we need to think of ways to, to go from these type of drawings uh, of a workflow to something that uh, you know, they, they can manage. Um, so far, you know, we still, um, the best we could do is in this uh, Jupyter notebooks, but um, I'm hopeful maybe with chat GPT, we can train these things on, on workflows and, and have a more, um, you know, a better way of, of um, generating these things. So um, in the meantime, other things that we've done, we looked at different uh, fault tolerance strategies from uh, job retries uh, or data transfer retries to rescue DAGs where, you know, we cannot do anything more and we just give it the, the executable workflow to be fixed. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we also checkpoint files and so we can restart things. Um, so then the, the new stuff that we've been doing, we've been trying to figure out um, when the workflow is running, is it destined to succeed or fail? So with our collaborators from Argon, Renzi and uh, Berkeley, people that, that uh, are uh, machine learning experts, we've been applying um, graph neural networks to, to the workflow execution graph. So you, you have, um, uh, data coming from all the different types of executions that we do um, uh, and uh, over time. So this is an example of a graph. They apply first um, graph neural networks um, to the problem, capturing the structure of, of a workflow, doing various transformations with graph neural networks, and then um, using NLP to do the characterization. So looking at either the whole workflow and saying, okay, it's a success, uh, or a failure, or looking um, if it, there was an anomaly in the workflow or not, or looking at individual nodes, the com different computations, and saying, is it an anomaly uh, or not? And so uh, they applied, uh, our collaborators applied um, these techniques to various types of workflows that you see, so the thousand genome, which was bioinformatics, now cast and wind are from this CASA radar uh, work, uh, work that I mentioned earlier. Um, the clustering just tells you if we clustered the jobs uh, together. And uh, you can see the accuracy of the F1 scores and so forth. So here is just looking model by model. Um, and some of them are easier to learn than others. So the thousand genome was pretty easy to, to learn and gives you good accuracy. Um, the wind workflow was kind of harder to learn. If you give a model uh, of a, a different workflows at once, um, you can see that the uh, learning is, um, uh, is is okay. I mean, it's not not perfect by any means, but at least you can, um, with some certainty, you can say whether the anomaly is during execution or not. And then what we did, this is our GNN method. We compared it to other methods from the literature, and we also compared it um, to some of the earlier work we've done, where we took the execution traces uh, of the workflows we put them as an image, so uh, as a Gantt chart, and then uh, we use different image uh, processing algorithms to try to figure out whether the execution was anomalous or not. And so out of these, um, the graph neural networks, uh, this was the thousand genome, um, did better uh, than others. So I think there is more work to, to be done in this area and trying to figure out exactly where Okay, so you have an anomaly, but where is it? And what type of anomaly? Um, so where is it? You can put point with a node, but what type of anomaly it is and how to fix it and how the workflow should respond to it is another thing. So uh, what can we do better? Uh, so I think we, we're making progress in the anomaly detection and error classification. Uh, we're working also on using uh, machine. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, well, permission, I'll ask you. Okay. Um, it's okay, you can, you can ask. Hi, I can do it right now. So, yeah. uh, how much is like uh, platforms or maybe the workflow itself? It, it can be either. 
Yeah. You have to train these models for whatever, like, in the platform that we work for getting that out. Yeah, so, so what we do is we run on test beds like Chameleon, um, which is a cloud test bed in the US, and we introduce various types of an anomalies. So hard, uh, um, hard drive anomalies or network or others, and then we train the, uh, the system on that. And so part of the challenge is to basically get enough data to, to, to do all this. So, you know, um, that, uh, that takes a lot of time to turn data. So we are actually looking, or our collaborators are looking at data augmentation techniques and adversarial models to generate the data for us. So it's mm -hmm. it's a whole whole kind of interesting world. Um, but yeah, so we want to do better adaptation based on failures. I think you know this issue of work for your use and composition. I think through things like Chat GPT, I think would be very interesting. Um, uh, and trying to explore that and how scientists can start having a dialogue with tools like that to help them basically um, not replace them, but really help them along the way and have a more discussional uh, type of uh, interaction. And then, like I mentioned, uh, you know, challenges of collecting enough quality data uh, with appropriate labels, um, then, you know, we, different structures. So, we looked at, uh, in terms of anomaly detection, we tried to put it as the Gantt charts and tried to do imaging on it. We're trying GNNs. Um, so trying to figure out what really works in a particular situation uh, is also time consuming. Uh, as uh, I just want to mention, you know, as you uh, use all these techniques, you have to kind of keep in mind the impact on the environment because as we're trying to set, solve the various environmental problems, and I know you have Copernicus in, in, in Europe and stuff, the more computing power you throw at it, the more you mess up your environment. So, you know, like the, uh, this was a few years back, somebody looked at the, the uh, CO2 emissions from transformers and that basically, you know, my air flight is like somewhere here. It was this, uh, you know, to here, whereas these uh, emissions are just uh, crazy for, um, for these transformers. Obviously, it also depends what are the sources of energy that you use. So some uh, uh, areas are more environmental friendly, use uh, hydroelectric or other types of uh, energy to do the computation. So um, we need to be mindful of that. So um, in conclusion, we have basically uh, a growing heterogeneity uh, in our environment. So we have a high performance systems which are themselves becoming much more complex with specialized hardware and data storage. Um, and they increasingly have more thoughts. So they kind of look more like the distributed systems uh, used to look like. Um, the distributed yeah. systems themselves have more software defined uh, capabilities. So you can define um, you know, your network flows, you can program your networks. Um, you have very specialized data storage that you can uh, leverage. Um, obviously, you have clouds, which um, you know people are using more and more for science, but they're also very heterogeneous and and uh, can be costly. So you have to worry about that. And then uh, you know you have neuromorphic and quantum architectures that you can throw in the mix. So that that makes the whole system really uh, complex, but also interesting. And uh, so you need to be able to manage this uh, complexity under different constraints, and you know not forget about the carbon footprint. Uh, but you also need to um, to do that. You need to collect a, a lot of data. You need to deal with this fault detection and adaptation, which I haven't uh, mentioned much. So, in conclusion, you know the five principles that we developed over the years for Pegasus: this uh, resource independent representation, the submit locally, run globally, uh, different flexible data staging configurations, and, and data movement. And also integration with different systems, um, I think, carried us forward from you know 2000 uh, to today. Um, but um, we have much more to, there's much more to do, and I think we live in interesting times where we can apply these uh, various machine learning uh, algorithms and see where, where they take us. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we need to be mindful of uh, the environmental impacts. So, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions. I don't know if there are questions in the room, right?